Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory and honor. Lord, we invite you to be here among us. Encourage us and use us to your glory. May our worship service be acceptable in your sight. Amen. May this worship service be an opportunity for lives to be changed, decisions be made, and for you to enter our hearts. Bless everybody buying before you, and may in everything we do, your name be glorified. In Jesus' merciful name I ask. Amen. Okay, let's turn to your hymn books and let's open for hymn 337. Hymn 337. Let's sing with joy. Sabbath day and any day that we get together on Sabbath is a good Sabbath day but any day that we can have a baptism is a great it's a wonderful Amen. Sabbath day I have been so privileged to get to know my friend Dan Renteria and Dan has been such a such a faithful brother and he attended nearly every I don't even think he missed a single meeting or uh, he says maybe one operation blueprint meeting as we were presenting and as we were presenting night after night, Dan came to me and he said, Pastor, I just feel like the Holy Spirit is inviting me to be rebaptized, And I want to do that as a public declaration for my church family as well. And so, Dan, it's been such a privilege to get to know you. And I am just so thrilled 
that you are listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so, my brother Daniel, because of your love for Jesus and your desire to follow him wherever he leads, it's my privilege now as a minister of the gospel to now baptize you in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Morning and happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 22, verses 36 through 38. The scripture again is Luke chapter 22, verses 36 through 38. And it reads Then said he unto them, But now, he that had a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that had no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this, that is written, must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. May God bless the reading of this word. Have a happy Sabbath. Let's sing our song for preparation for prayer. You will find it in your bulletin or on the screen. Those that are able, let's kneel together as we continue to worship. Father God, it is so good to be here together in your presence, in your house this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we have, that so many have fought for, so that we can worship as you have directed us to, that we can be free to praise your name with, without fear of any harm. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised that you will be with us and that we can learn how to better serve you and that we can leave this place today praising your name and honoring you in all that we do and say. Lord, I want to thank you for our safety and our health for this week. And we pray for those in our church family who are not, um, don't have the health that they want to. I especially ask you to be with my dad, George Baglas, as he continues to 
um, be on this journey of um, the cancer that he has. Be with the others in our prayer list, especially Brenda Joyce's cousin, Candace, as she has a massive tumor on her lungs, and all the others on our list, and those that don't, uh, we don't know, um, that have special needs. We ask you to please be with our, our sister Gloria, who fell this week, and we praise your name that she was not seriously injured, and uh, will soon be back here at church with us. Please be with Sister Indra, who is not feeling well today. Lay your healing hand upon her and also on her mom as she recovers from her hip, hip surgery. Please be with the pastor, Lord, as he brings your words to our ears that we may learn more about you and about what you want us to do to share your love with those, those around us and those here on this earth. We thank you for the many things that we have to praise you for, and we ask you to help us to find those blessings wherever we go. I especially want to praise you for my daughters who's celebrating her birthday this weekend, that we can have this time together. Thank you, Lord, that you give us families, that we can know a little bit of the love you have for us through the love that we have in our families. Please be with each and every one of us and the needs that we have on our hearts. We praise you that you hear and watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Um, I want to draw your attention to an item in the bulletin. Matter of fact, it's in the um, it's the offering section. Uh, it talks about our church budget. It's, it's the report section, and you can probably see that we are under budget by eighteen thousand dollars, and. I'm so glad that as Adventists, we believe in systematic giving, and it's not a really a, uh, an emotional response. It, you know, the, even the, in the order of um, worship, we put the offering before the sermon and, and not after that. So it's, it's not a judgment on the, um, how the sermon goes, right? Um, but it's, an, it's a response really for each one of us to to God's love. Uh, I'd like to read a couple of verses uh, from the book of Haggai. This is just a small book in the Old Testament, Haggai chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 4. It says here, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? And we continue on. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Basically, what it's saying is that, you know, we put in a lot of effort and try to make a living, but we just can not get ahead. Why is that? Uh, verse 9 actually gives the reason. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house, that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So 
just in case you think that, wow, you know, it's such a curse. Uh, I'd like to turn your attention to a story in the, um, also in the Old Testament, which is in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 17. It's actually, I'm not going to go through it, but it's about David. After he uh, had been king for a little while, and he looked around and said, I'm, I'm living in, uh, I'm doing okay. I like to build a house for the Lord. And so, so he told um, the prophet about that. And the prophet Nathan asked the Lord, and the Lord um, gave him a vision. And then the prophet went back to David and said, uh, um, no, you're not actually, you're not going to build a house for me. Um, your son is. And then he, it, it, um, the Lord actually gave a list of uh, things that for him to do. Um, but one verse in particular, and, and one, one um, thought that, that I, can, I can grab out of this, is that Nathan told uh, David that because of your faithfulness, the Lord is going to prosper your house. And he's not talking about the physical house, but really he was talking about, the Lord was talking about David's household. So let, let us think about that. You know, if we do something for the house of the Lord, he will surely bless our house, our household. That's what he means. I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward to collect um, this morning's offerings, and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being the Lord of our lives. I pray that as we return our tithes and offerings to you, that you will demonstrate your faithfulness to, to us. Oh Lord, it is not really a response, however, but this is really the way that you have told us, that, that you have promised us that we can test you in this regard. So I pray for our own faithfulness, Lord. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning's offering is for the faith, uh, conference faith at advance.
little bit. There we go. Now I came a little strong there. I'm sorry. You can turn it down just a little bit, Sydney. Thank you. I want to invite my brother Dan to come up this morning, and I want to present him his baptismal certificate. I'm inviting the elders on the platform to join me this morning. Congratulations, brother. And I know that others are encouraged. And Dan was hoping that his baptism, his, actually his, his rebaptism this morning, would be an encouragement to others who know they need to be baptized or perhaps even the Holy Spirit calling them to be rebaptized. So, brother, thank you for the encouragement that you've given me and that you've given this church family in moving forward in faith. Amen. Do what? Do we want to reaffirm him? Okay, even though he is a member of, let's, let's do that. Those, you've witnessed his rebaptism this morning. Let's just reaffirm uh, our commitment to loving him as a brother in the Lord, as part of our church family, and as a member of the Campbell Church. Those in favor, please say amen this morning. Amen. Any opposed? I'll see you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> I'm so thankful that we can be here on this beautiful Sabbath morning, and I'm hoping that I have the correct uh, pointing device this morning. Let me see. Well, oh, it, it works, I think. All right, good. This morning, um, I'm presenting a message called, Bring Your Sword. No, Bring Two. And so you're wondering, you know, where did that come from, Pastor? Actually, I had one of our church members who asked me, a week or so ago, uh, a question about a text in the Bible that it, it is problematic to understand. And so as I prepared an answer for her, I, I just felt impressed by the Lord to present this also to our church family because I believe it's very timely. I believe it's very relevant to us living in the year 2014. Uh, you may have noticed, but there has been a fairly dramatic rise in the number of different groups that are being trained as military personnel outside of the military. They're called state militia, or they may have some other name that they go by. But there has been a, a really a significant uh, increase in the number of individuals who are joining these military groups. And they call themselves militia or something like that. Militia just means that there are ordinary citizens who are being trained and equipped as though they were in the military. So you understand that that's what militia stands for. This is a graph. There was a peak. They thought this was the all-time high number of different groups that were part of patriot or mili militia groups. This is the year 19... Well, I don't know if I have a pointer. Well... This is the first column is the year 1995 and there was a, a period of time you can see here for quite a few years that there weren't as many of these groups but then there's this dramatic increase since the year 2009 in the number of groups that are joining <coughs> these different militia and they're being trained as though they were military personnel and some of these individuals have some it's okay if I say some scary um, ideas and so when we see groups like this rising there is a concern but it's also amazing that the number of different people that are joining these groups they're not just uh, I, I hate to use I mean I don't want to judge but not unbalanced individuals but some of them are actually part of religious groups and so some of these uh, groups are they have an agenda they they feel as though we cannot trust the government or some of these individuals who join these groups feel as though things are so uncertain. They're not confident that the government will handle things in, in, a, in a proper way in the future. And so they are arming themselves. They're being trained to, to fight. And there are many individuals who have just a generalized fear about what's going to happen in the future. And as a result, they're joining these groups because they want to feel as though they can take care 
of themselves. And so the question really comes out, and here's the deal. As I was researching this, I found out that there were many of these organizations that had religious background, that they were part of churches or other religious groups. And so the question this morning is, should a Christian take up arms to defend themselves? Where, where does a Christian fit into all of this? Is there any biblical support? Is there any biblical guidance to help us out to know whether perhaps we should go out and join one of these groups? Now, there are some people who are survivalists. And you know, they've gotten a lot of headlines recently. Survivalists are those individuals who feel like, you know what, the future is so so dicey, so uncertain that we need, to, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to find some place out in the woods someplace. I, we watched a special about individuals who are actually building these bunkers underground. They're having a huge piece of machinery dig a, a, a monster hole in the ground, burying a hole like a house made to be underground, and then burying the thing back up. And the only thing you see maybe is one little innocuous uh, uh, entryway a stairway that goes down there and they're they're putting cameras around it they, they want to know if people are coming into their perimeter I mean it's it's really an interesting mindset but people are really buying into this they're stocking up foods and provisions and they're 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 taking uh, guns and ammunition and stocking these things up and saying you know what the rest of the world may fall apart but I'm going to defend my turf I'm going to have a, a safe, secure, a safe, secure place for my family in case these things happen. Well, well how are we as Christians to, wh wh how are we to posture ourselves? What, what does the Bible tell us? And so now I go to my next slide. Okay, I've looked at myself long enough. All right. But I'm still looking at myself. Let's see if I can get back on the slide program here. Okay, there we go. This is the text in Luke chapter 22 that a lot of individuals who have religious connections are pointing to and saying, this is the text that, that tells us that we should indeed arm ourselves. Luke chapter 22, Then he, this is Jesus, said to them, and this is to his disciples, but now he who has, oh wow, I just can't seem to not be going... Now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So it seems here, if you just read this single text, it seems very clear that Jesus is putting his blessing on arming up. Would you agree with me? And that's what he says, right? Right? Come on, don't be scared. I'm not trying to trick you. It's okay. As a matter of fact, if you don't talk to me, it's going to be a really long service. So if you want to get out of here soon, you need to say amen. amen. Hey, praise the Lord. Wow, we're going to get out of here very soon. So Jesus says this, and it seems to indicate from the text that he's saying, arm yourselves. Because he asks the disciples. I mean, he tells them. If you don't have a sword, then let him go and get one. I mean, we don't usually have swords. I mean, maybe people in some places in... I don't know, L.A. have a sword, but most of the time here, people pack guns. You understand what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, I saw this thing. It says, he who lives by the sword shall die by the person who doesn't believe in swords but has a gun. So, you know, we, we don't bring a knife to a gunfight these days. So, but, but here's the problem, because you may remember that Jesus said something almost to the exact opposite of this back earlier. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 10, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed what? Now, this is when Jesus sent out 70 disciples two by two to areas that he was going to visit. He was going to go there and he was going to preach there. And so before he went, he made sure that things were made ready by disciples who would go ahead of him and say, Jesus is of Nazareth, the prophet, is going to come and he's going to preach here. And these are some of the things he's going to be talking about. Tell everyone you know. So when he appointed these 70 and he sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where himself was about to go, notice what he told them. Now these are his marching orders for them as they're going to go out and prepare these towns and villages, these cities to receive him. He says, carry, help me out here, carry neither what? Money bag, knapsack, nor what? And then he, in the end, he says, and greet no one along the road. It sounds like a sense of urgency. Would you say amen to that? A sense of urgency. But he says here, don't carry your money bag. 
Don't go home to get your knapsack, which would hold provisions for the trip, nor sandals. In other words, you don't need an extra pair of shoes. Just go just as you are and do it right away. And it seems like Jesus now in Luke chapter 22 is saying something entirely the opposite. So how are we to understand what Jesus says? Well, in Luke chapter 22, notice what he says. He said, but now he, he who has the money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack, and he has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Exact opposite. Okay, so that's the problem. But here's the context. Here's the context. Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 10, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. And you can see Luke chapter 22 when he tells them to do all those things he told them not to take. But Luke chapter 10 is pre-crucifixion. This is early in Jesus' ministry. And what he says in Luke chapter 22 is, hello, thank you, it's post-crucifixion that Jesus is looking forward to. And Jesus is saying something has changed. Something has changed between Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 22. And what is it that has changed? Well, let's go back and look at the context of what Jesus said. And so now Jesus is referring, he's actually tying his statement in Luke chapter 22 to what he said in Luke chapter 10. Notice this, because in Luke chapter 22, then he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, naps, sandals, did you lack anything? So you see Jesus is pointing back to what he told them earlier. When I sent you out before and told you to take nothing, were you lacking? And what does Jesus tell them? I mean, what do the disciples respond back to Jesus and say? Hey, we, we were good. You we had everything we needed. And so what Jesus is saying, if you trust me in telling you what you will need for the future, will you lack anything? And the answer is a rhetorical what? No. If we will follow Jesus' instructions, we will lack nothing for the future. Nothing. Doesn't that, doesn't that make you feel good? If we follow Jesus, will we lack anything in the future? No. Nothing. Whatever. And so now he goes forward and says, then he said to them, but now, this is a really important statement. Something has changed between Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 22 because he says, but now... But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment. He's saying that having a sword is more important than having extra clothes. So does that mean that we should go and arm ourselves up? Well, we need to be good students of God's word. Amen? Which means we need to follow the rules. Number one, we need to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Oh, that was weak. Do we need to have the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study God's Word? Amen. Yes, we need that. But we also need to look at all the evidence. Amen? All the evidence. We need to compare scriptural things with scriptural, and we need to decide. We need to base what we understand as truth from God's Word based on the weight of evidence. Amen. We learned this in the Operation Blueprint Seminar. If you didn't come, see, you're already behind the power curve. But we found out that we have, to, we have to take all the evidence and then truth is based on the weight of evidence. I mean, isn't how they decide that in a case in the court system? I mean, if someone comes in and says, oh yeah, this, this guy did it. I mean, do they take him out back and hang him on that? No. It would be a travesty of justice. They need to get all the evidence and we need to do the same as Bible students. And so we take all the evidence and compare it. And so now we need to look at what else Jesus said. Now, this is what Jesus said. This is on the same night that he has just told them to bring a, a money bag and a knapsack and, and, and extra sandals and bring a sword. And so now we're going to start understanding what Jesus meant when he said to bring a sword because he says in Matthew 26, and by the way, this, again, this is the same evening, the same evening. Notice what Jesus said. But Jesus said to him, after, after someone has pulled a sword out, who was that someone? How do you know that? Because it says in John 18, 11. Amen? That's why I put it up there. It's recorded in two different places. Jesus said to him, that is Peter, who has drawn the sword, thinking, okay, Jesus told us to, to bring our swords, and now's the time to use it. Scary. Peter with a sword but anyhow so Jesus after he's taken a swipe at the high priest servant and managed only to get his ear I say praise the Lord that he didn't cut a little bit closer amen that was a close shot he cut off his ear and 
Jesus says to him, do what? Put your sword in its place. Help me out. For all who take the sword will do what? Will perish by the sword. So is Jesus talking out of both sides of his mouth? Or did the disciples misunderstood stand what Jesus was saying just a few verses up in Luke chapter 22 he says those who take the sword will perish by the sword as a matter of fact in Matthew he also says he goes on to say or do you think and now Jesus is saying why he told Peter to put up his sword he's saying don't you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with what I mean, is that overkill, 12 legions of angels? That's way overkill, because remember just a few days later when one angel comes down and they have a hundred hardened battle soldiers from the nation of Rome guarding Jesus' tomb. One angel comes down and what happens? Did they put up a good fight? They didn't fight at all. Why? It says they were on the ground as though they were dead men. That's one angel. And Jesus is telling Peter that he could call from his father for more than 12 legions of angels. And just like that. So is Jesus feeling like he needs some Peter with a sword to make him feel secure? Yes or no? No. He doesn't need it at all. Jesus knows that his heavenly father will take care of every physical need that he has. You just thank you very much for the amen. The rest of you missed a great opportunity to say amen. Do you think that God can take care of your needs? Good answer. That, was a, that is the right answer. And that's the reason it's a good answer. He will provide you with everything you need for the trip. So now we're still trying to understand, is Jesus trying to tell us that we need to arm ourselves in order to be safe in this world? And so now we have part of the answer because Jesus is saying, look, it's not the physical sword that I need because I could call, I could call my father and he will have the armies of heaven down here in an instant. And all of those people who are opposed to me would fall away as though they were dead. So notice Revelation 13, 10 says, now this is looking forward to the future because Revelation 13 is looking to that time right before Jesus will come again. So is it relevant to us or no? What, what we're going to find out. It's very relevant. In Revelation 13, 10, it says, he who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. And this is a physical sword that is being talked about in Revelation chapter 13 where the agency that Satan is working behind will oppose God's people and he has killed some of God's people but God is saying look those who live by the sword those who oppose me by the sword are going to do what they're going to die by the sword and indeed this prophecy was fulfilled and it will be fulfilled again before Jesus comes again but now we need to know about this sword because it says in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, said this. He said, put the what? Oh, come on. How much of the armor? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Can you say amen to that? We need to put on the whole armor. Do you know something about that armor? Well, of course you do. Our kids learn it in Sabbath school class. We've known it forever. But it says very emphatically in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the, what helped me out? And the sword of the, which is the, amen. There is an offensive weapon that you and I are called to use as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. We have an offensive weapon and it's called the, it's called the Bible. It's called the Word of God. Now, some people go, what, Pastor, what are you going to do if these big guys come after you? Are you going to throw your Bible at them? Well, not unless God inspired me to do that. But it says that, that the offensive weapon that we have been given as Christians is the Word of God. Now, I want you to review with me exactly how effective this weapon is because... In writing to the Hebrews, the Apostle Paul said, For the word of God is living and what? Is it powerful? Yes. It's sharper than, notice this, than what? Ooh. Any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
I've actually seen this guy in a, in a cutting demonstration with these swords. I mean, you can see this, this reed mat that he practices cutting with with these swords. It's cut in two pieces, and they are both still up in the air. This guy knows how to use a sword. These are sharp swords, and I, it would be scary just to even walk around with one and not even hurt yourself. But it says here in Hebrews that God's word is sharper than any sword that man can produce. And it cuts, and it cuts in the right way. Well, notice in Revelation again, 19.15, it says, Now out of God's mouth, this is out of his mouth, goes a what? So this is very symbolic language, and it's saying there's a sword that comes out of God's mouth, and it says that with it he should strike the nations. And so before Jesus comes again, God is going to slay individuals with what? With his word, which is the word of God. So if God is going to actually do destruction with his word, then we can rely upon God's word to protect us. Can you say amen to that? But a lot of people are saying, but that just doesn't cut it, Pastor. I want something more than a piece of paper to fight against. I believe this. I believe that if we equip ourselves with how Jesus tells us that we will be more than conquerors through him. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that with everything that I have. And so... Now we kind of understand that when Jesus was telling them to bring a sword, he wasn't really telling them to bring a physical sword, but he was telling them that they needed to be armed for the future with God's word. Can you say amen to that? Okay, well, let's go forward. Luke chapter 22, and this is the reason that we need to be armed. I mean, Jesus is telling them that something has changed. Something changed between Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 22, and things have become more serious so that Jesus is saying, For I say to you that this which is written must be accomplished, notice, in me. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. In other words, Jesus is saying, Everything prophesied about the Messiah, how he was going to suffer, is going to come to pass. It's all going to be fulfilled. And so Jesus is trying to tell his disciples in the clearest way that he can, that dramatic events are just about to take place. It's just about to happen. Notice what he said this same evening to his disciples. It's recorded in John 15, but again, we're talking about the same 24-hour period. He told his disciples, remember that the, the word I said to you, a servant is what? Not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, what does Jesus say is going to happen? They're going to be persecuted as well. And so is Jesus about to be persecuted? This is on Thursday evening before his crucifixion. In just maybe only a few hours after he spoke this word, he was arrested. He was beaten. He was tried illegally. He was taken then to the Romans who beat him and tried him. And then he was crucified. Don't you think this was going to be a, a complete shock to the disciples? Even though Jesus had told them ahead of time, they heard none of it. But again, Jesus is trying to tell them what is going to happen in just a few hours. And he's saying, look, if I am persecuted, and he knows he's going to be persecuted, guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to persecute you as well. And so now we understand that Jesus is telling them that they need to arm themselves. Notice what he says in John chapter 16. Again, that same conversation. Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come. That you will be what? That you'll be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Jesus is just looking ahead just a few hours by the power of the Holy Spirit and saying, it's, you, you can't imagine how close it is to being fulfilled. And it was fulfilled. They're, they're, the disciples are going to be scattered. I mean, they had been with Jesus. They weren't afraid of anything while they were with Jesus. Except they got into a couple of storms and they were afraid of that. But Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith. But Jesus sees that their faith is going to be severely tried. In John chapter 16, again, These things I have spoken to you, this is Jesus speaking, that you should not be made to what? See, Jesus is telling his disciples ahead of time because he knows that Satan is going to try to get them to give up on their faith. And by the way, do you believe that Satan is trying to do the same thing for you? 
Yes, he is. Yes, he is. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. These people are so convinced that Jesus is a deceiver, that he is not the Messiah. They're so convinced that the little group of disciples that he has with them are some group that needs to be put out of existence. They, they will be so convinced of it that they will be willing to kill Jesus and kill his disciples and they think that they are actually doing God's will an amazing thing Matthew 24 9 speaking of this same time it says then they will deliver you up to tribulation what is tribulation it's trouble big trouble they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated what by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is looking forward. He's seeing that his disciples are going to be severely persecuted. And by the way, he sees the church that will exist right before he comes again. He sees that they will also be persecuted. And so he's telling them in Luke chapter 22 what they need to be prepared. I like this so much. Matthew 24, 13. But he who, it helps me out, he who endures to the end might be saved could be saved no it's an absolute assurance it's a promise it's a promise that Jesus gives us that we will be saved if we will endure if we will hang on and Jesus is going to prepare us so that we will have everything we need on the road ahead and then he goes forward and says and this gospel of the kingdom what might be preached could be preached no he says it will be preached in all the world as a witness to how much all nations everyone and then the end will come I say amen to that I want to get to that point really quickly do you too I want the I want the message to go out but as we commit ourselves to sharing the good news of the gospel is the world going to be okay with it by and large is Satan going to be okay with it absolutely not he's going to oppose us he's going to persecute us and he persecuted the disciples just in the same way so when Jesus said to them but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. You know what Jesus is telling us here? He's saying you need to take every resource you have right now at your disposal and use it for the furtherance of the gospel. He's telling the disciples that, and he's telling us that as well. The disciples were to use everything they had to furthering the gospel message. And when they did that, Satan was going to be there to persecute them. We need to know ahead of time that as we commit ourselves to being faithful to Jesus, the world's not going to pat us on the back and say, oh, isn't that great? Hallelujah, brother, right on, amen. No, they're going to be there to oppose us. And Jesus has given us information ahead of time so that we could be prepared for the trip. Because when the disciples followed Jesus' instructions, were, did they lack anything? No, they lack nothing. Will we lack anything? Absolutely not. Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is exactly what the disciples had when they went out and preached the good news of the gospel. And by the way, the end time church is going to look exactly the same. Exactly the same. They will be those who keep the commandments of God by the grace of God, and they will have the faith of Jesus. But now I want to share with you a very, a very poignant quotation from the book, The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, and this is in the context of God's church before Jesus comes back the second time. This is page 593 from Great Controversy, and I'm quoting, Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be what? They will be opposed and derided. That means they will be made fun of. They, they, will be, they will be held up as crazy people. But notice this. They can stand only what? How can people do this? How can people be identified with God's end time church? Only as they stand in God. In other words, only as they have faith in God. Only as they claim his promises and cling to Jesus by faith. But notice what Ellen White goes on to say. In order to endure the trials before them, they must understand some things. What are they? You and I need to understand some things. What is one of the things? The will of God as revealed in what? His word. 
So we need to know the Bible. We need to cling to what the Bible tells us because the word reveals, notice what the word reveals to us. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of what? God's character and God's what? His government and what? His purposes. All of those things must be clearly understood by those who are going to stand up at the end of time and resist Satan and everything that he throws at them. It's important that we know about the character of God, that we know about God's government and his purposes. And you know what all of those things sit on the bedrock of? That God is love. His character is is a character of love. His government is based on love, which means his government is based on freedom and his purposes, which means we understand the plan of salvation, how it is that God is saving us. We need to understand all those things if we're going to stand before Jesus comes again. Notice, and act in accordance with them. In other words, it's just not head knowledge, but it needs to be how we order our lives. Can you say amen to that? Notice this, and now this is just just one quote, and I'm giving you pieces of of one quote. Notice this next thing that Ellen White says so clearly. None but those. What does it say? Does that mean anyone gets excluded? No, it says none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. So how important is it to know what the Bible says about the character of God, about the government of God, and the purposes of God? Only those who endeavor to know that information about God will stand through the last great conflict. And so my encouragement today is that we would avail ourselves of this time of relative ease to get to know God through his word. Can you say amen to that? It's it's imperative. There's no... There's no plan B. There's no alternate to knowing the word of God and having that word of God in our hearts and in our minds. Again, going forward with this quote, to every soul will come the searching test, shall I obey God rather than man? The decisive hour is what? Even now at hand. People are making choices right now. Little choices, maybe not seemingly not that important choice but people are making choices right now if they will obey God rather than man and I'm so thankful like my brother Dan who took a stand in baptism this morning he is he is standing up and he's saying you know what pastor I want to follow God no matter what happens in the future you know what that is a safe place to be and we all must be in that same safe place she goes on to say Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in the defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Are we ready to do that? The only way we can be ready is by allowing God's spirit to possess us now as we study God's word. That is the only safe ground that we can stand on. That's what Jesus says at the end of this narrative. He said, so they, that's Jesus' disciples, said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And what does Jesus say? And he said to them, it is what? He says it's enough. What Jesus is saying, if we ever needed to depend upon God's word, we need to depend on God's word right now. And even doubly so, two swords before Jesus comes the second time. My prayer and my encouragement is that you will take hold of God's word for yourself, that you will study it for yourself, and that the Spirit of God will strengthen your mind to stand through the last great conflict. And so we will stand there by the grace of God together on the sea of glass without one missing, and that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand all to sing our closing hymn, his hymn 216, hymn 216.
7, indeed this morning we have heard you calling us to stand on that sea of glass with you. And Lord, you have, you have told us everything that we need for the journey. That we would have the sword of your spirit and, and every piece of armor that you avail us. Lord, I pray today that we would determine that we would search the scriptures. That we would fortify our minds on the great truths. Lord, that we would be convinced of your love for us to the point that nothing would be able to separate us from your love, as the Apostle Paul said. Lord, indeed, dwell in our hearts. And as an evidence of your dwelling in our hearts, I pray, Lord, that we would love those around us with the same love that you have given us. And Lord, that all the world will know that we are your disciples because we have love for one another. Lord, equip us. Equip us from this day forward to march into your kingdom, I pray. And I thank you that we can in Jesus' name. Amen.